If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation with me this morning, please. Chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. The Greek word for this is apocalypsis, where we get the word apocalypse. Most people misunderstand the word apocalypse. They think it has to do with a conflagration of some kind or some kind of a, a you know, a, an atomic blast or so forth. But apocalypsis means an unveiling. It means an opening up, pulling the curtain back so that you can see into the future. Verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this revelation of Jesus Christ can come in a number of ways. Number one, what he is about to show us in the book of Revelation. We're going to see a lot of things. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But in the process, we're going to see a lot of things about Jesus Christ himself. So he's going to be revealed. So you can see a double meaning there. So in verse number five, the Bible said, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father, anoint this word, bless it, anoint the messenger, and send it forth for the purpose you intended. In your holy name, Lord, amen. amen. You can be seated. The book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing. It is a completion in the canon of Scripture. What does that mean? That means the last inspired book of the Bible. And it finishes here, 90, 95 A.D., written by the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. John was one of the twelve. He was one of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He was the one, the Lord Jesus said, that he will not die till he sees me come. And he did see him come in more than one way when he wrote the book of Revelation. If you notice, the book of Revelation is quite a book, though. It really is. It's a book that I've been in churches where they say it's a closed book. Close the book of Revelation, they say. No, you better open it, and you better get on your knees. You better read it, and you better pray. Because the book of Revelation, my dear friend, is as current as the newspaper you're going to pick up in the morning. The book of Revelation has defined, opened up, and made very clear to us the generation that we live in right now. If you notice in verse number 5, it says he's the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. That means that he's the prophet, the faithful witness. The priest, the first begotten of the dead. He now is a priest at the right hand of the Father, the first one to be raised from the dead, never to die again. And then he is the king, the prince of the kings of the earth, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of kings and Lord of lords. Look at verse number 8. The scripture says, I am Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet, which predates English by some considerable amount of time. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, this is the key to understanding Revelation, which is, which was and which is to come, the Almighty, past, present, and future. Incorporates all the elements of time, past, present, and future. Notice that he's called in red letters, the Almighty, El Shaddai. He's the Almighty One, the absolute, self-existing, from everlasting to everlasting, Lord Jesus Christ. Anything less than that is pure heresy. I don't care who you are, what you call your church, the Lord Jesus Christ is above all, my dear friends, and before all. But notice carefully what it says in Romans 11, 20, 20, 36. For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist you look up the etymology on that word, you'll find it means to hold together. Can you imagine 2,000 years ago the concept that everything that exists must be held together? And that we know to be a fact today. Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light, create darkness, I make peace, create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. This has to do with his sovereign will. He's the Almighty that answers to no one. Then in chapter 44 of Isaiah it says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and listen to this, and beside me there is no God. <laughs> Amen. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there's one God, one mediator between God and man 
the man Christ Jesus. If you notice it says in verse number 13 that in the midst of the seven candlesticks one likened to the Son of Man. These seven candlesticks represent the church of God. This is his church. This is his church here this morning. You are in the church of God. We have met. This is the bride of Christ. We're here till he comes to get us and take us home. But if you notice where he is, he's in the midst of that church. You find the Lord Jesus Christ revealed, revealed in Revelation in three distinct ways. Number one, in his beauty and his glory here in chapter one. But then in chapter number five, he's revealed as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Then in chapter number 19, he's revealed as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings coming on a white horse to do battle. Amen. Not bringing peace to the earth, but he's bringing war as a man of war. Notice carefully too, here in Revelation chapter number one, he talks, he speaks. He's speaking to his church, to his bride. And notice where he is. He's in the midst of it. Notice carefully, verse number 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, the Lamb of God is not in the midst. The one coming on a horse is in the midst of nothing. He leads an army out of heaven to do battle at the battle of Armageddon. So the Lord Jesus Christ is in the midst of his church. That's where he wants to be. That's where he has always wanted to be. And notice what it says about him in verse number, uh, verse number 14. His hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire. Contrast that with verse 13. One like unto the Son of Man. The Son of Man is his earthly title over 80 times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's called the Son of Man. It was the Son of Man that went to that cross and died and bled and suffered so that you could be saved. The Son of Man, a personal identity that he took to himself. He identified with that term. And notice it says, he's the Son of Man and he's clothed with a garment down to the foot. This clothing, this appearance, this glory, this light, all of this majesty has to do with who he is now at the right hand of the Father, not who he's going to become. He has been glorified and he's, seat, and, he's, and he's seated now at the right hand of the Father. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you'll, in, you'll rejoice in what's being said about him. Amen. If you're indifferent to the Lord Jesus Christ today, you'll whole hum this. If you hate him, you're going to be mad before you leave out of here today because we're going to glorify the Son of God. Amen. I'm used to men being glorified. That's why I know that's your problem. But we're going to glorify the Son of God. We're going to lift him up. He's clothed like the Son of Man. He's clothed with garments down to his feet. This represents his priesthood. This is how the priest was uh, girded in the Old Testament. Then he has a golden girdle, the Bible says. This is, a, this is representation of power and authority for only the powerful and, uh, and those with authority had that. In Revelation chapter number, uh, verse number uh, 14, chapter 1, verse 14, 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire. Now the book of Daniel, which is a companion to Revelation, Revelation and Daniel fit together like you wouldn't believe. And it says in Daniel chapter number 7 verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Plain of words, millions upon millions upon millions. The day will come when all creation, everything that has ever drawn a breath of life, will at one day look at the Lord Jesus Christ and say, He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Notice what it says about him. It said he had eyes like a flame of fire. These are piercing eyes. These are eyes that cannot be, you cannot, you cannot pull subterfuge on these eyes. You can't hide from these eyes. You can't trick these eyes. They're perfect and pure, and they see to the very soul of the man. Fire in the Bible is equated with God time and time again. For example, there's the fire of uh, the fire of protection. You remember that that uh, column of fire that kept Pharaoh and his army from coming to the children of Israel. They couldn't cross the fire. They couldn't go across it because it was there for protection. There's the fire of cleansing. How many of you remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Commonly known to folks in the world as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, that's the fire of cleansing. They put them in the fire and the only thing burned were the cords that held their hands. 
Not a hair on their head was scorched. Amen. That's the kind of fire the Holy Ghost will put you through. When he said, you'll think he's going to consume you. He's consuming the old man to turn loose of the new. There's the fire of sacrifice. There was Elijah on top of Carmel. And this fell on Christ, if you remember, the fire of the sacrifice of God. There's the fire of anointing in the book of Acts chapter 2. There are many that say that this fire that came down, cloven tongues like as a fire, was anointing them to speak forth the word of God. The fire of holiness, the Bible said in Hebrews 12, our God is a consuming fire. Amen. I want to see him one day. I want to be close to him one day. I want to stand by his side one day. But my dear friend, he must prepare you to be able to come into his presence. And then finally, there's the fire of judgment, Torah. Nadab and Abihu, and then finally hell, fire of judgment, not fire that burns wood, fire that consumes in the place called the lake of fire. The Bible said his feet were feet like brass. Brass has to do with judgment. So when he stands in the midst of his church, judgment begins first at the house of God. Do you realize this today? He holds you to a higher standard than he does a blind pagan out here. Do you understand that? He holds you to a much higher standard than a blind pagan falling around in his ignorance. Amen. You have been called and set aside and anointed as the church of the living God. John 5, 22 said, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The scripture says he had a voice like the sound of many waters. Speaking, my dear friend, all the voices of all mankind, all the languages, all the thoughts, all the sentences, all the cries, all that man could ever say is bound up in the voice of the Son of God. Come unto me, he said, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. The Bible said he had seven stars in his right hand. These stars are the angels of the churches. An angel does not pastor this church. If an angel from heaven comes with any other gospel, let him be anathema. Amen. A bishop pastors this church. It leads me to believe that the angel he's talking about here has to do with a representation and a manifestation. There is one in this house this morning. If you read Hebrews chapter 13, read it carefully. There's one in this house today who's on the carpet. Every time I come through these doors, I will be held accountable for the truth of the word of God. Amen. Amen, folks. That is very important because that's who I am. That's what I live. That's how I live. I am accountable unto you for preaching the word of God. This is why you'll hear a message like I'm preaching this morning. So the scripture says, out of his mouth proceedeth a sharp two-edged sword. His word is the word of God. He's bound to the word of God. He's the author of the word of God. He preaches the word of God. He lives by the word of God. My dear friend, he is the word of God. And it can't rise no higher than him. And the scripture says, his countenance as the sun. And on top of Carmel, they saw Peter, James, and John. The Bible said, his face brighter than the sun as it shone. You don't want to look into the sun unless you've got the glasses on where God makes it possible to look upon the face of the son of God. The countenance. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And he said, behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Hell. The Old Testament word is Sheol. The New Testament word is Hades. So what is that, preacher? It simply means the unseen state of the dead. The unseen state of the dead could be a place of burning and suffering and sorrow on one side, but it could also be Abraham's bosom. The Old Testament Sheol was the place of Abraham's bosom, but the Bible said when Christ ascended to the heavens, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He emptied that side. He carried it to heaven with him and now seated at the right hand of the Father. He's got the keys, folks. He said, I shut, no man opens. I open, no man closes. I am the door, not a door, the door. No man comes to the Father but by me. Aren't you glad you're on the winning side? Aren't you glad you know the true and living God? Aren't you glad you're not bound down to a piece of wood? Aren't you glad you're not cutting yourself, lancing your back, and thinking that your blood will expiate your sin? No, my dear friend, the only thing that can wash your sin away is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed once and for all and forever. His blood is not shed weekly. He's not a living sacrifice week after week after week so that you might partake and partake and partake. One sacrifice for sins forever and set down at the right hand of the Father. Amen. 
and so our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the Antichrist. Let's compare him to the true threat that's Antichrist. You might call him the pseudo Christos. Pseudo, Greek word is pseudos. It means false, Christos, false Christ. The Antichrist is set over against the true Christ. So I never met him, preacher. Oh, you've met his spirit. You walk out this house today, you're going to be slapped right in the face with the spirit of the Antichrist. It's alive and well on planet Earth right now. Amen. America seems to be the seat of it too for the rest of the world. The Antichrist. Revelation 13 verses 1 through 10 tells us about him. In the book of Luke chapter 22 verse 3, the Bible said, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. What a sad thing. What a sad thing. One of the twelve handpicked. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? That's what he said. So look at the contrast between the two of them. Christ came from heaven, John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Amen. But the Antichrist... When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The Antichrist is coming up out of hell, folks. Hell is opening its gates, and it has been opening its gates. If you don't know that right now, you're living in a cave. Hell is being dished out upon this earth, and the Antichrist is the very personification of all that is damnable and godless and wicked. He's the Antichrist. And look at Nick, look carefully. The Lord Jesus came in the name of his Father, John 5, 43. He said, I am come my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. And the Antichrist will come in his name. You see, it's all about me, myself, and I. I am the consummation of all things. I am the goal of everything there ever has been. I am the greatest. I am. I am. I am. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. How much preaching do you hear like that? Me, me, me. I, I, I. Yes. You get a dose of it, a double dose every time you go into the church house. But the Bible says in John chapter number 5, and verse number 43, if another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. So the Lord Jesus Christ was rejected. Why did they reject him? Why did they reject the Son of God? Can you imagine why you would reject someone like him who never did a thing for himself, raised the dead, healed the sick, cast out devils, walked on water, fed the hungry, gave to the poor? What did the Lord Jesus Christ do that condemned him to a cross? What did he do? What kind of a man was he? Was he a man that was, was, he, was he like Barabbas? Bar Abbas, Spurgeon's got a good note on his name. Bar means son of Abbas. He's the son of his father. That's what the word Bar Abbas means, Barabbas. He's the son of his father. Guess who his father is? Read John chapter number eight and verse number 44 and you'll find out who Barabbas' his father is. What does it say in John eight forty-four? Ye are of your father who? The devil. That's who Bar Abbas' his father was, the son of his own father. So the Lord Jesus Christ came in his father's name. I come to do the will of my father. I live for my father. I left heaven for you. I laid aside my royal crown. I laid aside my robes of glory. I walked out of streets of gold. I left the land of the living and came to the land of dying. And what did you do for me? You took me to a cross and you hung me there. And I bled and I died for you. God's, the Lord, let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ showed man if you need anything anywhere at any time in your life to understand the nature of a man look how he treated the perfect sinless pure son of god and you'll get a dose of what men are like the bible said one time when he's talking to men he said did not commit himself to them for he knew what was in man for he knew man well let me talk folks two thousand years later nothing's changed Man's still the same. He's always been. Don't cast your lot with men. Don't put your trust in men. Don't fall for men. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus and he'll never fail you. Now notice these Jews rejected him. 2,000 years ago, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So why did they reject him? They rejected him because they didn't believe the Bible. You talking about the Bible? Yeah, I'm talking about your Genesis through Malachi. 
They believed in the, they believed in the oral tradition. They believed in the Mishnah, the Torah. Uh, not the Torah, but the Talmud. They believe that. A Jew today does not reject, and I mean to tell you this, a Jew today cannot reject the Lord Jesus Christ based on the Bible. He must run to the Talmud to reject the Son of God. Amen. He cannot take the Bible and show you why he rejects the Son of God. He must run to his Talmud, which was based on oral tradition, and the basis of it is the Mishnah. To reject the Son of God. That's important. The Bible says in Acts 5, 36, But before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be something. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away disciples after themselves. False messiahs. Israel, folks, has been plagued. The Jews have been plagued for 2,000 years with false messiahs, one right after another. Rabbi Akiva, one of the greatest rabbis in Judaism, said that Bar Kokhba, he's the shining star, was the Messiah, but he wasn't. He wasn't. He caused thousands, yea, millions of Jews to be crucified. Moses of Crete decided that he was the, he was the Messiah, but he was not. Menachem bin Solomon said he was the Messiah. He was not. And then Shabbatai Zephi said, I am the Messiah, but he was not. Anything but the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't have a good track record when it comes to messiahs. And even in the present day, but the Bible teaches us that they will accept the Antichrist one day when he shows up. Notice carefully what it says in Philippians 2.8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Cross. Let me tell you what the church needs today, folks. It doesn't need more buildings. It doesn't need more organization. It doesn't need, it doesn't need what people put their faith and their trust in, you know, even money itself. It's, that's not what the church, what does the church need? It needs humility. Humility. Did you know that a humble man is a praying man? Did you know that a humble man is a powerful man? Did you know that a humble man has the unction of the Holy Ghost upon him? Did you know that a humble man can receive instruction from God? Did you know the Bible says that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble? Do you realize how humility is such a great blessing from God that it's not something you find, it's something the Holy Ghost leads you into? The only way that you could ever become humble is not think you are, but let the Holy Spirit lead you in a life of subjection, a life of dependence, a life of confession, is to walk with the Lord and to seek after God and hunger for him day in and day out of your life, is to say, I can't live this day, I can't make it another day, I've got to talk to God, amen, 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 amen. amen. Humility is one of the greatest blessings there is. The Bible said he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Self-exaltation, that goes right along with self-love. That goes right along with self-esteem. Religion today teaches you to build up yourself. That's what religion teaches you. Religion teaches you today is your best life. Here in this world, get what you can, here and now. And you don't worry about living for the future. You don't worry about living at the judgment seat of Christ when you judge everything you've done. Get it here. Get it now. Get all you can. Can all you can get, amen. Yeah, here, now, me, myself, and I. God bless your soul, folks. I don't hate you. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you that the spirit of this age is the spirit of Antichrist. I watched a woman look at a man yesterday and she said, let me tell you something. She says, science doesn't mean a thing anymore, to paraphrase her. If I say that I'm a man, I'm a man. I may not have XY chromosomes. I may have XX chromosomes. I may not have the biological things of a man. But if I think I'm a man, I'm a man. Let me say back to her, that's exactly where the Antichrist wants you to be because you're crossing the fence from science into pseudoscience, into metaphysics, into paranormal. And that's what, my friend, I've been studying time and time and time again the last few weeks, and I watch it develop so quickly. Chat GPT. How many's ever heard of Chat GPT? Just a moment with it, all right? Imagine taking every book that ever ever been written. Imagine taking all of the literature of the earth, everything that man's ever known. Imagine taking all the accumulated knowledge 
and putting it into a database that can be accessed unlike before any database. In your brain, there are things called neurons. A neuron is the part of the brain that fires and fires and fires and fires in so many different directions, so many different ways. And it's communicating. Neurons communicate. It's communication. That's what this chat GPT is about. They say that it has no more than simply a supercomputer that's able to access anything that you ask. It's able to create uh, all kinds of algorithms that formulate its ability to answer. And they say that's all it is. No, let me tell you something, my dear friend. What's a Ouija board? How many of you know what a Ouija board is? Amen. It's nothing more than a piece of wood. That's all it is. But when you take that Ouija board and you begin to move your hands about it and you start speaking to the spirit world, are you listening? When you start speaking to the spirit world, everything changes. Amen. When you pray and say, Lord, bless and help me, fill me with the Holy Ghost, you're talking to the spirit world. When you say, oh God, have mercy upon my soul and cleanse me and forgive me, you're talking to the spirit world. It's not wood. It's not flesh and blood. So what do you mean, preacher? I mean this. I mean now they've got a program in chat GPT where you can talk to the Lord. They've got a chat GPT Jesus. Oh, how they're filling all the gaps, how they're producing, how they're getting the people ready to communicate, they think, with nothing more than a smart, smart, smart artificial intelligence. But the truth of the matter is, it's simply a front for opening the spirit world. Amen. That, my friend, is where I warn you today. If we don't know about the spirit world, we need to shut our doors and go home. If there's any place on this earth you should be able to go to to understand a little about the spirit world, it ought to be the church of God. Amen. How many agree with that? Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. And so what are we doing? We're getting ready for the Antichrist. That's what we're doing. We're telling people that it's no longer science. Now it has to do with how you feel. What's moving through your soul. How you want to project yourself and what you want to be. Believe me, there's a spirit waiting for you right now to begin to talk to. Now, here's the thing with chat GPT. You can ask it practically any question, has an answer. You can take a law exam with it, has an answer. It's loaded with information, unbelievable, and it's, and it's moving exponentially forward. You see, you can carry on a conversation. Probably now you can talk to your dead mother or your dead father, or a dead husband, or a dead wife. It's just a matter of time before you will not be able to dif differentiate between the real and the unreal, the fake and the real. We're walking into a never before seen era. We're walking into a new land, to a new world, to a new place that nobody, I've been at this a long time, nobody 30, 40 years ago, a prophecy teacher never saw this coming. They didn't see it coming, and I've said time and again, there are things, the book of Revelation, written for the generation of Revelation. They'll understand it. Amen. We're approaching that. We're getting ready for that. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? What protects me, preacher? What can I do, preacher? You can take the Bible. You can read it. You can say, Lord, open my eyes. Open my soul. Open my spirit. Let me speak to me. Not from here. Not from there. Speak to me from your word. Get on your knees and talk to God. And ask the Holy Ghost to give you wisdom. You need the Holy Spirit, folks. Don't grieve him. Don't quench him. We need the truth of God's word. This is the only light that will get you through this darkness. Till the Lord Jesus comes for us. Christ came to do the will of the Father. He came to do his will. I'll close here in a moment with a couple of things. I hope I've stirred your mind. I hope I've made you think. I really do. Because I read uh, a number of articles on chat GPT, then went on YouTube, watched a few things. Here's what you do now when you get into stuff like this. You try to find consistencies. You try to start connecting dots. You don't want to get way out in left field. Some folks get way out in left field. You know, they, take, they, they, they jump to conclusions. Well, I'm not going to jump to any conclusions. I'm watching. I'm listening. I'm waiting. I'm reading. 
Why, preacher? Because I watch for your souls. That's why. Amen. I watch for your souls, folks. I take that very seriously. I'm the one that God holds accountable here at Temple Baptist Church. Think about it. We're, by, we're just about there. That makes me want to shout. Amen. Oh, man, that, that really does. It makes me want to shout. It does. You know the golden years of old age? <laughs> well, I got the years, but where's the gold? <laughs> but I'm thankful for what God's given me. This next Sunday, I'll be 77. And when I was 15, I thought 77 was ancient. Lord have mercy. 77, good. Night, man. Can you see? Do you breathe? Do you sleep? Whoa, 77. But now, my dear friend, I look at the ones that's 97 and I think he may be getting up in years. 77. You, a lot of it has to do with you're as old as you think you are. I'm as old as God's made me. He's, I'm here till he's done with me. Here are some of the titles of the Antichrist. And I'm going to close with these. He's called the little horn in Daniel 7. He's called the king of fierce countenance in Daniel 8. He's called the prince that shall come in Daniel 9. He's called a willful king in Daniel 11. Called a man of sin, 2 Thessalonians 2. The wicked one, 2 Thessalonians 2. The beast, Revelation chapter 11. The son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2. There's one man in the Bible that's called the son of perdition. Y'all know who he is? Most of you know. Sure you do. It's Judas Iscariot. Lost none but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Makes some believe that the spirit of Judas Iscariot will be the spirit that rises up and energizes the Antichrist. And he, and he incarnates himself in him. I don't know. That's a, it may be so. Maybe. Who knows? But I do know this. I do know that we live in an ignorant generation. Yes. We live in a dead generation. We're living through a generation that now is beginning to dabble with spiritual things. The minute that they cross the science barrier, you remember when you went to school? You remember all this stuff about, about evolution? Well, that's the science. You remember all that? Science, science, worship science, science, science. It's no longer science now. Now we've crossed from science into how you feel, your experiences, stuff like that. My dear friend, let me warn you this morning. Please let me warn you. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot more time left with this. There's too much happening too quickly. That's right. Too much too quickly. If you're not ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ today, I'm not so sure you'll be ready to meet him tomorrow. Amen. You have an opportunity this morning. You can do something about this. You can. Tonight, if God doesn't change my mind, I'm going to be preaching about the Lamb of God and the one on the horse, Revelation 19. Pray for me. Would you do that? Amen. Satan doesn't like this. I got up this morning, fired up my computer, got all my work done, hit print, and that printer just sat there. I thought to myself, now what? The printer just sat there. How many's ever had an experience like that? Love, hate, you know. Fine printer, good printer, best printer in the world. Hit print, and it just sits there. I said, Lord, help me through this. I thought to myself, this has got to be Satan. He does not want this printed out. And so I hem hauled around, done a click or two, this or that, and this and that. And finally, it was an Apple computer. And Apple's real good for recognizing computers, uh, printers and stuff like that. Fired it up again, and it printed. And I said, thank you, Lord. Amen. Can you imagine having all your work here in front of you? All right? And you can't print it out over here. So what do you do? I carry my computer over here, and I set it down right here in front of you. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> but Satan doesn't like it. He doesn't like what's going on here. Won't you do something about it? Won't you come? Come down here and talk to God. You got a lot of questions? That's good. Come to the one who can answer your questions. You got a lot of sin in your life? You haven't prayed in a long time? You in fellowship with the Lord? Won't you come down here and talk to him about it? He won't turn you away. He won't stomp you down. No, no, he'll accept you. You got problems, troubles, cast your care upon him, for he careth for you. Amen. Amen. And then when you get up and walk out the door, we all should do this as we leave, and you do it to yourself, do it silently if you want to. However, as you walk out that door there today, you say, Even so come, Lord Jesus come. Amen. 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 Father, bless your word now in your holy name. Amen.
Even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Now, I can understand if you're, if you're not right with God, something between you and the Lord, I understand that you're a little nervous about it and you really aren't really excited about the Lord coming back. I can understand that. Believe me, I can. <laughs> but there's nothing greater that could happen for you, for me, for this earth, for anything than the coming of the Lord, Amen. folks. The coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. That is, that would be the, that's the most important event that could take place. This is why John said through after the book of Revelation, after seeing all of it, experiencing all of it, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Are you ready for him? Are you ready? What do I have to do? Nothing. He's already done it all. Just come and accept the one who's done it for you. Amen. He's your sacrifice. He's your Lord. He's your righteousness. He's your holiness. He's your faith. He's your blood covenant. He is. He's your forgiveness. He's your access to God. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's the Word. He's everything. He's life. Touch Him. You've touched life. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything Amen. that we need is the Son of God. Amen, folks. I can't, have, I can't say that enough. Let's stand up and sing. What have we got here, brother?